board. Okay, welcome everyone. It is July 11th, my sister Katie's birthday, so don't let me forget. Uh, she'll kill me if I don't call, contact her. Um, July 11th, 2018, and uh, we're going to make this a pretty quick one. This is just going to be about real estate inspections, appraisals, and valuation, uh, and kind of understanding a little bit about how the different processes work. Those of you that have been in real estate, you understand these for the most part. Um, pretty simple concepts. Those of you that are newer, uh, hopefully this is something that you're learning for the first time and or solidified in your memory banks. So let's begin. Um, differences between an inspection and appraisal. Think of it this way. Effectively, the inspection is the, the eyes and the ears and the nose and usually screwdrivers and a bunch of other tools of the buyer. So they are the ones, the professionals going in for the buyer and the buyer pays them to do the inspection. Inspection takes a couple hours, really big houses can take three, four hours, smaller houses usually two hours, something like that. So it really just depends on how thorough they are. And what they do when they go in, um, is pretty simple. Actually, let me we'll hold off on that. We'll go through the differences of them first and then we'll, we'll, we'll kind of delve into that. But so the eyes and the ears of, of the individual that doesn't know anything about a house, doesn't know anything about composite roofing or hardy plank siding or God forbid T111 siding back in the 70s, you know, different kinds of siding that failed, different windows that are failing, maybe there's moisture in something. Um, so they're the eyes and the ears and the professional for that buyer. The appraiser, they are the eyes and the ears of the lender. So the lender who could be in New York City, Miami, Florida, Texas, wherever, they're going, okay, we're about to lend hundreds of thousands of dollars on this house. We want to know if this house is really worth it. We want to know what the problems are with this house, and we want to make sure that the value <clears throat> is there. Inspectors not looking for the value, they're just looking for problems. The appraiser is looking for value and problems. So, and it depends on what kind of appraisal it is. Uh, so, that's really the difference. So, the eyes and the ears of the lender, the inspector is the eyes and the ears of the individual buying the house. Now, there's different kinds of appraisals, a little bit different when you get into FHA, VA, and USDA. So those are government loans. And um, we kind of go into that in financing, but uh, government loans effectively are just backed by the government rather than Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, quasi-government institutions that apparently can't fail, too big to fail. So. Um, so if they run out of money to the tune of $100 billion, the government's going to back them out. <clears throat> but Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are traded on the stock market. So it's really, that's why I say quasi. It's a really interesting uh, entanglement with the government. But so government, government appraisals, um, they require a little bit more attention. And really what they're looking for is peeling paint. They're looking for broken or cracked windows. They're looking for... Uh, make to make sure the appliances work. They're, they're really making sure that everything is in good working order, that there's a cooking unit, that there's flooring. Uh, they'll take a look at the attic and they'll check for mold and insulation and see if there's any real problems there. Uh, appraisals don't take very long. An appraisal really takes about 20 minutes, maybe 30 minutes. A good appraiser is going to spend a little bit more time. I've seen some crummy appraisers lately that are spending like 10 minutes in a house. They go in, they take a few measurements, some pictures, and they're out of there. So, and they're really, it's really loosey goosey with appraisers. Um, they can just go in and again, those pictures, they don't really have a good memory of what the house was when they do their appraisal. You know, they, they say things like, well, it has uh, forced air heating, for example, when in fact it has radiant heating. So they don't even make note of that. So the government appraisers are looking for a little bit extra, and the peeling paint is usually the one that comes up the most. Uh, they're the ones that, you know, they're looking at the windowsill. They're looking at wood to earth contact. If there's any sort of siding that's reaching down into the earth, they're going to call that out, and they're going to have to have it fixed, or the loan's not going to happen. So. 
Um, <clears throat> let me kind of continue on on those government appraisals, just because you will run into those occasionally. And peeling paints, number one, when they do fix it, when the homeowner fixes it, they have to make sure they clean up the peeling paint. So if they're going to scrape a couple windows, they got to put a tarp under those windows, make sure there's no peeling paint in the soil. So they, they really got to do a good job. Now, what I've done in the past is a little bit of scrape, <clears throat> kind of, uh, you know, collect the paint peelings and then uh, do a little bit of primer on there. And primer is good enough. That's a paint job. That's sealing it so that the new buyers, when they come in, can do a more thorough job, maybe scrape the whole house and paint it, you know, midnight blue, whatever they're going to paint it. So just to kind of get the appraiser moving forward and signing off on the appraisal, you can do the bare minimum. Certainly a cracked window is going to have to be fixed. And if there's mold, that's going to have to be uh, remedied as well. So um, obviously there has to be carpet or flooring of some sort. If there's subfloor, that's not going to fly. So they'll call that out. But that's really the difference. And a regular appraiser, they just come in and they measure the house. They measure the rooms. They make sure that the square footage is what the assessor is, has assessed it at. And they verify that it's you know 3,000 square feet, that it really is three bedrooms and two bathrooms and has no circumstances that might hold up the, uh, the loan. <clears throat> so pretty simple there. Um, the inspector. Inspectors are, um, inspectors are really important for a variety of reasons. And if you're ever confronted with a situation where do we get an inspection or we don't get in, in an inspection, the answer is get the inspection. <clears throat> Always get the inspection. Advise your clients to get the inspection. Advise everybody <laughs> that you ever talk to to get an inspection. The reason I say that is because we have so many agents in so many states. We operate um, on a pretty big level. So I see a real 30,000 foot view and almost every single lawsuit and or threatened lawsuit involves the inspection. So they go immediately. Lawyers, it's like it's like a pack of wild uh, hyenas and, and fresh kill out there. I mean, if they if they're looking at a problem, they go right after the inspection. Was an inspection done? What did the inspection report say? And if there wasn't an inspection done, they'll immediately turn to the real estate company, us, and say, why didn't you have an inspection done? You guys are to blame for this. So there's a real problem with that. Now, that's number one. That's my personal pain. <laughs> and again, I, I think I handled it fairly well. Um, <clears throat> I don't get spooked by nasty grams and things like that. We just run its course through the proper channels. But the state will also look at that as well. So the state really requires the real estate commission. They really, really want to make sure that we are encouraging inspections. So when you're confronted with that, please try to advise your clients to do the inspection. It really reduces the liability and the risk. And it is a very, very good idea. Now, there's, there's certain people that won't do an inspection. They, um, contractors, for example. Let's say they're flipping a house. They're like, look, we're going to tear this thing apart. We don't care if there's black mold. We don't care if there's this or that. We're going to gut the thing down to the studs, rewire it, and so on and so forth. So they, they're pretty familiar with that. And even when you have someone like that, go ahead. Here in Washington, they can actually sign off on a waiver of inspection. So the inspection report or the inspection form at the very bottom of it says waiver of inspection. Some states don't have that but most states do. So um, ask me if in your particular state, uh, whether or not there is a waiver of inspection, but typically there's a box somewhere in the purchase and sale agreement where you can waive that. And so if they want to waive it, great. At least they've acknowledged that. Um, and you've advised them to get the inspection. Some people have a hard time, you know, ponying up $350, $400 for the inspection. They probably shouldn't be buying a house if they can't pay for an inspection. Uh, they're, they're probably a little bit too tight there. But um, if you get into that situation, you can always call me and we can try to walk through their particular situation and perhaps uh, free up some money on the finance side so that they can actually pay for the inspection. Um, so that's the main difference. And, and inspectors, well, you know, it's, it's, there's a ton of them out there. Uh, here, just in our Spokane headquarters, we've got out on the table there, we've probably got 40 or 50 different inspectors and their brochures, their cards, things like that. Uh, it's good to develop a relationship with a couple, three of them. And if you can, you know, you can, you can turn to ones that you've never used before because the market's pretty tight and or they're busy on vacation, so on and so forth. 
The key to inspectors is you want to talk to them within hours, if not minutes, after that purchase and sale is signed around. So there's a lot of wheels that are set in motion once that purchase and sale is signed around. And the inspection is one of them. So that's where you're getting on the horn um, and you're saying, hey, I really need you to get out there within the next couple of days. They might say, I'm on vacation in Tahiti, can't do it. So then you move on to the next one. They're all licensed and certified. The amount of hours it takes to become an inspector is pretty intense. So if they have their license, they're pretty good at it. Usually people from a contracting background, some sort of construction background, handyman background. Um, but you want to get them out there as soon as possible because you usually have a certain set of days, a week to 10 days, maybe two weeks. On the purchase and sale, you can adjust that. But you want to get that going right away because you have to schedule it out a few days and then they show up and then they need a few days to kind of put their report together. So <clears throat> you, you really want to make sure that that initial period, everything is moving quickly after the purchase and sale is signed around. Of course, the earnest money is delivered to uh, escrow or the attorney's office, and you've got a receipt for that because that is a big bugaboo with the state. Okay. Any questions? Let's check the chat room. No questions. Okay, good. Let's keep on moving. Um, but I choose inspectors on a variety of different, different methods. I mean, really, one is cost. One is timeliness. Will they get out there? Will they be thorough? Will they really look at everything instead of just kind of going through the motions? A good inspector is really, they're down on their knees under the house. They're up on the roof. They're poking and prodding. They're checking every outlet, making sure it's polarized correctly, make sure the wiring's correct. They'll look at things like, um, you know, copper wiring versus the crappy tin wiring and, and different things like that. So they want to they want to make sure that the house is complete, it's sealed, it's tidy, that everything's working properly and that good um, products were used in the construction. So they're really a, they should do a thorough job. And, and you'll know if you work with some, you have a bad rapport with them. It's probably not someone you want to return to. So they should be friendly as well and they should be very helpful. Uh, to your client. Most of the time I have my clients show up and they can be there for the full three hours if they want or they can go ahead and, and you know maybe introduce themselves, write a check, pay for the inspection up front and then just trust the, re the report. So it's really it depends on what you want to do but it's a relationship you'll build here in Spokane. I've got a couple inspectors I typically go to. Uh, in Seattle I've got a couple inspectors I go to. Other markets where I don't do a lot of business, if I were to do business there, I'd probably ask other people, hey, who do you use? Are they good? What do they charge? Um, <clears throat> there's different kinds of inspections. The, the, the inspections vary from a general inspection to specific inspections, a sewer inspection, a pest inspection. Um, they can do a neighborhood review, the buyers. Um, so there's a lot of different kinds of inspections, a roof inspection. So typically what happens is you order the general inspection and then you add on or supplement a different or an additional inspection. I personally, if it's an older house, I want to have a sewer scope done. So I order that at the same time, cost an extra $150 or so. But make sure that in that older house <clears throat> that the line to the sewer system is complete, it's sealed, it's, it's good. A lot of times you'll find tile pieces that are broken off or roots that are kind of manipulating their way into the sewer line and it could clog it up. So sometimes you see a completely collapsed one. Um, we had one this morning where the scope couldn't even go 20 feet. And so, you know, we need the, the seller to clean that out so that the scope can go all the way out to the sewer line. So we need additional time to do that as well. So there's a lot of different factors that go into it. But if it's an older house, I do the inspection with the sewer uh, inspection as well the sewer scope. And if you've never seen that, it's, it's kind of gross, but it's kind of cool at the same time. So yeah, big, long camera that, with a light on it that gets fed all the way out to the sewer line. So um, it's, uh, it's an interesting process, but it's one of those that makes a house very, if it works right, makes a house much nicer than one that fails. And I've actually seen ones that fail and had to go out and dig up sewer lines before. So not a pretty job. Um, 
Pest inspections are pretty important. Usually the inspector will find some sort of pest infiltration. They might find some holes in the wall. They might find you know, an ant's nest or carpenter ants here or there. And then typically at that point, you'll order an additional inspection with a pest specialist. So that can happen as well. Um, it is a step-by-step -step process depending on what you find. You cross each bridge as you get to them as needed. Uh, but a pest inspection is pretty important, especially if you see in the seller disclosure that there was some sort of pest infiltration years and years ago. You want to make sure that that's been mitigated, there's no problem, and get a specialist out there. Roofs as well. Sometimes an appraiser will call out a roof and there might need to be some roof work done, or the inspector might say, hey, you know, the flashing's failing, there's, um, there's rot on an, uh, an eave of some sorts, uh, then you're going to have to really get a professional out there to make sure that that roof is good. You might see water stains on the ceiling inside, and then you go, whoa, wait a second, hey, there's there's some sort of problem up there. When the roofing specialist gets up there, he might find some missing, a missing tile or missing composite material, so the water's coming right in, and then it would have to be kind of opened up, and the wood would be replaced, make sure there's no mold, and then resurface it. So it can go anything from a, a very quick patch job, could be a caulking job, to replacing the entire roof. So you'll see that the more years you're in this industry, you will see roofs needing to be replaced. So that's an, an example of a roof inspection that uh, really is warranted. And, and you, know, you don't want someone to buy a house and go, oh, okay, I've got to replace this whole roof. Sometimes that roof professional will need to certify the roof. They'll come out and give it a three or five year certification. That can be really difficult this time of year because those roofing specialists are, guess what, doing roof jobs. So for them to come over and take a couple hours out of their day, that's a really um, difficult proposition for them. So again, having a bunch of them that you kind of know and you can call on when they are needed. Um, okay, Agua, here it is. Let's get into um, appraisals. So hopefully you guys don't have too many questions on inspections. Oh, before we do that, let me go back into, I know I pulled one up. If you've never seen one, here's an inspection report. So this is a recent one here in Spokane, a nice little bungalow, um, ba -ba -ba. receipt, invoice. They paid $300 to Nate. He's a good inspector. And then it's effectively 42 pages, as you can see up here. So I'll just kind of go through it real quickly. Um, we've got green boxes, which are good. Yellow boxes are okay. And we're looking for the red boxes that could be a problem. So, you know, there's a little bit of crumbling foundation there, nothing major. This is a hundred year old house. And so a good mortar person can kind of mortar those joints back into place. So we're looking for all the issues. There's no rail there. We actually asked for that uh, in the inspection response. So that was one of the things we asked for. Do, do, do. Everything else looks good. We go you know, through the grounds. No issues really. When there are issues, you'll see them in here. See these red arrows or red boxes, things like that. More mortar work here. We, he noted a tree was growing pretty close. So there could be some root problems. Um, but, but, but the grounds are satisfactory, things are operable, hose bibs. Here's the roof, he's up there. You know, could be cleaned off, but the composite material looks okay. Nothing to worry about. Roofs typically have a 25 year lifespan, so you want to make sure it's got a good 10 years left, 15 years left. Just one of those things that a homeowner needs to know. Um, condition, marginal. And you can kind of see some failings here, uh, but nothing, nothing really bad. Sometimes you'll see um, some additional mortar. It needs to be point and tucked and pointed into these joints. So a roofing specialist can do that or a chimney specialist. But lots of green here, so it's in pretty good shape. You know, vegetation, moss, things like that happen. You just want to keep an eye on that. But so far, so good. Nothing major. Chimney looks okay, marginal, um, uh, something to be aware of. A low spot near the foundation where the drain ends. So he noted that you know maybe there's water moving soil through here and there could be a problem under the soil. So something to be aware of. 
Um, soffit, some issues, painting, peeling paint there, an issue. Nothing major again, just kind of kind of tired. I always call this tired. Now this here, this fascia board is loose. That's a problem. That should be corrected, um, either replaced or certainly um, nailed back up into the roof and treated and painted. So again, a 100-year-old house, you'll find this kind of stuff. Um, but so he's pointing out all these little things that need to be addressed. Now, a lot of this is weekend warrior stuff where they can buy the house. They know the problems. They can make a list. And over the next 20 weekends, they can knock them out and really get the house tidy because you don't want to ask for too much in a buyer's, I'm sorry, a seller's market. If it's a seller's market, you know, if you ask for the moon, they're not going to give it to you. So you want to be careful about what is important to ask for, which to me is typically health hazards, um, things that could start a fire, things that could cause mold, things that could re be really unhealthy. Those are the things you have to ask for. But if you're just, if you make a long list and ask for everything in a seller's market, you're probably not going to get it. So it is a little delicate dance you have to do in this market. Um, but, 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 but yeah, other joints that need a little bit of attention. But again, we've seen a lot of green and yellow, nothing too major. This device right here checks polarity of the um, of the outlets, so make sure things are you know wired correctly. So if you don't have one of those little tools, they're pretty cheap, and you can get them at any hardware store. Um, da, 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 da. So exterior things are looking good. Again, I want to get through this fairly quickly. Garage could use a little bit of paint. It's it's okay, but um, again, a hundred year old house. So most people that are buying a hundred year old house are aware that there's going to be some age issues and some issues that might make it tired. Um, if, they, if they find that nice bungalow that is perfect, it's going to be an expensive house because everyone wants the nice bungalow. They're typically in better neighborhoods, close into the city, near parks. You know, they're much more well-established. But um, obviously, a 100-year-old house is going to have some issues, typically. Um, yeah, here's some peeling paint on the garage. That actually had to be fixed, so that was one of the things that, that we had to take care of. Garage floor, settling cracks. There's only two kinds of concrete, one that is not cracked and one that is going to be cracked at some point. So don't freak out if you see cracked concrete. It doesn't mean that the whole thing's coming apart. It just is one of those things, the nature of concrete, it settles and cracks happen and they can be sealed up and typically they don't move after the initial cracking they don't move very much now sometimes they do move sometimes it's the earth is moving apart and, and there's a big problem there but natural concrete will crack at some point uh, garage carport nothing too major there <clears throat> kitchen everything was satisfactory except there was a little bit of issue see the water coming in under the sink and so he uh, noticed that and felt the sink should be replaced, and uh, they ended up replacing it. This was a rental house, by the way, so it wasn't, you know, they didn't expect it to be perfect. Uh, they expected it to have a few issues. Window painted shut, so on and so forth. So just noting all these things, and they take pictures, and, and if there's a real issue, they'll let you know. So here's one, recommend GFCI, ground fault circuit interrupter. They're the ones with the little buttons, the outlets. Um, that means it interrupts the circuit right there at the outlet versus at the junction box or at the um, at the breaker panel. Okay, so they they change those out to GFCI. GFCI outlets should be in every uh, room that has water, so the kitchen and the bathrooms. But, uh, obviously, cracking. What was that? Cracking caulk. Um, ba, 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 ba. There's the polarity, so ungrounded GFCI, that little device will tell you if there's a problem, and so on and so forth. Looks like a typical rental tub, might even be some mold right there. That should be probably taken out and re -caught. Closet door, okay, some issues there, but a lot of green still. So for an old house that's a rental, this is pretty good shape. Let me get into interior. Fireplace. Um, yeah, I don't think the fireplace was even working, but they knew that. CO detector, safety hazard, that had to be installed. So that was one we saw and needed to be done. 
Uh, knob and tube covered with insulation. That was a safety hazard. We had a professional, an electrician, come out there and make sure that the wiring was secure and the insulation was not touching it. So again, things that can cause a fire, those have to be taken care of. Up uh, above some knob and tube. If you don't know about knob and tube, that's the old kind of wiring. It's exposed wires. Um, real old houses, that's how they did electricity. Uh, today, uh, it is much better wiring. Romex, and it's all insulated and so on and so forth. Handrail, a safety hazard there. So that typically can be a pretty easy remedy. Um, and basement, looking for moisture, looking for mold, looking for cracks, looking for previous water damage, things like that. Maybe insulation that's poor, you know, so the basement gets real cold and then it seeps up into the uh, living area. Do, do, do old pipes, things like that. We noted they probably would want to replace those with some modern flexi tubes at some point. But they worked, so didn't have to. Um, water heater was okay. Those typically will fail after 15 years or so. Heating system, pretty standard. That was that's been replaced, so it was in decent condition. Electric cooling system. There's the breaker box. I think there was. Oh no, it wasn't this house. There was an issue. Uh, sometimes you see some cheap wiring, and that can be a fire hazard. Uh, windows marginal. There's a crack. Now this was not a government loan, so the loan went through without replacing this crack. But if it were a government loan, that crack would have to be repaired. Dining room, kind of a cute little bungalow, but okay. So that's 42 pages of inspection. Okay, so let's get rid of that. And that's what the report looks like. So now let's get into appraisals. Appraisals happen. A lot of people, I, I, sometimes I hear this where people say, well, just call up the appraiser and get the appraiser done. Appraisal done. Or, um, you know, choose, choose your appraisal, your appraiser. I'm sorry, I'm getting those mixed up. Choose your appraiser. You can't do that unless you're just doing it for personal reasons. If you're financing it, the Dodd-Frank bill prevents us from having contact with those appraisers, and it goes through a third-party appraisal management company affiliated with the lender. So the lender, basically, they order it through the appraisal management company. The appraisal management company picks an appraiser out of their pool, and they send them off to do the appraisal. And we just don't know about it until they, they might call up the real estate agent and say, hey, I need to get in that house um, at 3.30 on Tuesday. Is that okay? Something like that. But we can't, lenders can't call them. They can't manipulate them. They can't communicate with them. This is all from the Dodd-Frank bill um, and the mortgage meltdown and the fallout. Back then, if you're not aware of it, back then you could just call up an appraiser buddy and say, hey, yeah, I need you to appraise this thing. And they'd be like, all right, well, what, what price do you need? Say, well, we just, uh, we refinanced it last year at 350. I need you to get me 450. Okay, I'll get that. So they inflated it, and then you go out and have a few beers with them and their buddies and, and all that. So after one year, they inflate that price, and then people would be skimming money out of there using a home equity line of credit, and then the house would collapse, and the lender stuck with this house that's worth three fifty, dollars but there's a $450,000 debt on it. So because of that and because of some of the crummy loans that were out there, the um, some of the non-conforming stuff, interest only, um, all sorts of different crappy loans, those are mostly gone now. And the appraisal management companies were set up to prevent that communication. And so the appraiser is simply doing their job. They can't be influenced by anyone. So that means a couple things. Uh, one of them is they do crappy jobs. I mean, I see appraisers that just go in and they're like, I don't, I don't care. I'll go in for 10 minutes. I'll take a couple pictures and I'll come in low. I see the purchase price is 300. I'll do 270. So they don't care. They'll make a ton of mistakes because they're not beholden to anyone. They just don't do a good job, I think, in my opinion. Overall, there's certainly people that do a good job, but a lot of them just don't. They're not thorough because they're not. If they do a crappy appraisal, it's not like you go, well, let's not use that person again. No, nope, they go right back into the appraisal management pool and the lender just chooses them. Bank of America, Wells, Quicken Loans, they just choose them automatically. And yep, they go out and they, they get the job done 
and that's all that matters. Um, so there, it's a little bit of a goofy dynamic. I'd like to see that tightened up a bit. I'd like to see some legislation um, making the appraisal process a little bit better, but uh, we'll see. There's talk of that, and I don't, I don't know what's going to happen with it. But it would be nice to see that maybe, okay, keep the system in place, but just make it better, like most things uh, with government. So that's kind of where the appraisals come from. And the appraisers can be, they can just be goofy, or they can be really good, either one. Uh, so that's my, my biggest fear is that they don't take their time and really get the value that we need, because in this appreciating market, we need them to get that value. There's a buyer out there willing to pay a price. Can they support that price? So, and, and how they do it, how they look at the value, is really kind of interesting. It's not, it's not too different from what you guys do uh, when you're value, doing a valuation. They go into the MLS, they have all the same information. They typically, if it's in a city or a metro area, they go out one mile from the subject property. That's why you get that little radius circle in the MLS. So you go out a mile, then you take a house that is, are houses that are roughly five, seven years younger, five, seven years older. You want to make sure it's in that same time frame. So if it's a 1955 house, you want to look at comps that are 1950 to 1960. And you might go 61, you might go 49, something like that. But they want to get it as tight as possible. They want to keep the bedrooms within one, and they want to keep the bathrooms pretty much the same. So if it's a four-bedroom, two-bath, they'll go up to a five-bedroom, two-bath. But typically, they won't do a five-bedroom, three-bath, and especially if the other factors are there, like uh, you know, 1964. That's a little bit too new compared to the 1955 subject property. So they keep it within within these parameters. They want to make sure the square footage is close. If it's assessed at 2,500 square feet, they'll go 2,650. They'll go 2,400, but they don't want to go 3,500. That's just not a good appraisal. So they go back six months as well. So six months, and that's the problem with an appreciating market. So let's say the market appreciates at 10% for the year. Well, six months, that's 5% appreciation. When you're talking about a $400,000 purchase, that is $20,000 right there. So they could go back and find the perfect comp that sold six months ago that sold for $20,000 less, but the market has appreciated 5% in that six months, and so it really is worth that 20% or that, that 20,000 more. So that's, you know, it's a really hard thing to deal with because the market is so hot right now. So I'm hoping the market cools off a little bit so that the markets are appreciating at 5%, 6%, 7% a year so that the appraisals come in at value and that we don't get an overheated bubble that could be a problem. So that's one of the big concerns out there just globally and generally in real estate right now. Um, but the appraisal timelines, you want to order it as soon as possible, but you don't want to order it too soon. So let me touch base on that a little bit. Um, a lot of people will say, hey, order the appraisal right away. Well, whoa, 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 time out. You don't want to order it right away because what happens if the inspection comes up with something that's really damaging and the deal's dead? Appraisals, by the way, since the Dodd-Frank bill, appraisals have gone from like $300 to $700. So that's the cost of this goofy process and system, throwing in a couple middlemen in there. Um, so we've gotten much, much more expensive, and the buyer's on the hook for that. So you know, for them to write a check for, let's say, $300 to the inspection and $600 to the appraisal, and then you find out three days later they don't want to buy the house because the inspection says it's got you know mold all over the place, it's got a roof that's failing, and so on and so forth. So now they're out $600, and they're not going to move forward with the appraisal. So the best thing to do, again, with timelines is you want to get that inspection done as soon as possible. At the same time, they should be the buyer should be putting their, all their information into the lender, their tax returns, their pay stubs, their bank statements. Make sure they've got all of that so that the second that you agree upon the inspection response, you get the inspection behind you, that the appraisal can get ordered. And so then that moves into a next phase. And the appraisal typically takes about 10 days, maybe two weeks. Now, it can vary. So VA appraisers are a little bit more difficult to find. So someone who's VA certified in a tight market might 
they might take two weeks, three weeks, or even four weeks. Um, last year in Portland, we were out about six weeks for VA appraisals. So, and it's very hard to become an appraiser. Very, very, very hard. I think the last thing I read was 2,500 hours. That's basically two full years of study to become an appraiser, which is kind of silly because they really don't do that much. They measure the house, they take a few pictures, and then they find the same comps you guys will find on the MLS. So I just don't, I don't think it warrants that kind of time commitment, but because of it, there was a, an appraisal shortage, but now it's catching back up. Plus inventory is low, so the demand's not quite as, um, as high for them. So, you know, a couple weeks, you know, just plan on a couple weeks. So you try to get the inspection totally behind you in one week, and then you've got the appraisal in a couple weeks. Now during that appraisal time, the loan is being underwritten. So when that appraisal comes back, the loan is underwritten and you've got conditions to clear and a clear to close. You know, so if, if the conditions are just, hey, one, two, three items, one of them being the appraisal coming back at value, great. You take care of the other two items and then you kind of had the, this meeting at about the three week mark where everything's coming back and getting signed off so that you can close the deal within that, you know, proverbial 30 days. So that's uh, appraisals. You just can't rush them. There's no calling them up and saying, hey, can you move faster? Hey, how about this comp? That's a, actually a good segue into um, low appraisals. A lot of times, um, a lot of times people, you know, they get these low appraisals, probably seeing, I'd say maybe 33%, a third of the time we're getting low appraisals. And so it's very frustrating because the seller wants more money. You've got a buyer willing to pay more money, but the lender's not going to lend the money because they don't see the value in it. So it's all about risk mitigation for the lender. They're not going to, if, if they don't see the value in it, they're not going to loan on it. So you go, okay, well, I'm sure I've got these comps that are going to work. They're better than your comps. Again, you're a lazy appraiser. You use crummy comps. So what about these? Well, again, appraisers are not beholden to anyone. 10 years ago, we used to do that, and they'd be like, oh, yeah, that's a good comp. Thanks. I'll change that, and we'll, we'll redo the appraisal. Uh, that doesn't happen anymore. The appraisers know. They don't. It doesn't matter. They can say, no, I'm not going to use those. Screw you. So it gets a little testy, and I've, I've had some real dicey conversations with appraisal management companies uh, saying, hey, you got to get rid of this person. And they're like, no, we can't. Sorry. So they come in low, you give them better appraisals, they might adjust the value $100, but they came in $20,000 low. So just to kind of throw it in your face, so, oh yeah, we'll adjust the value, how about 100 bucks? So it's, it's just goofy. And then you have to come to that point where it's, all right, all right, Mr. Seller, Mr. Buyer, what are we going to do? We have a low appraisal. Um, of course, you know, it'd be natural if the seller said, okay, I'll come down to that price. But you know, sellers are greedy. They're like, no, I'm, I'm, I'm going to put it back on the market. So then sometimes buyers are going, well, I'll pay the difference because it's a hot market. Let's say you're in Seattle. It's a hot market. There were 20 offers. Okay, I'll pay the difference with cash. So there are ways to make it work to adjust for that low appraisal. But um, just be aware that those appraisals about a third of the time are coming in low. So you have to kind of prep your clients for those and say, hey, there's a real possibility this could happen. Oh, let's see. We got the Mel. Appraisals in rural areas. How do appraisers adjust when it is a rural area with limited comps? Well, good question. They will let them go out more. I've seen in rural areas, I've seen them go out as far as six, seven miles. So really, it's a matter of going, okay, we're in this area. If it's suburban, probably not. So they might go out an extra mile. So a suburban area, two miles. Um, you know, but if you are in, and the, like the Dallas Mill, that that's, it should have enough comps, but they might let you go out three, four miles. I mean, if you're just really in a rural area, if you're in Othello, Washington, in between Moses Lake and the Tri-Cities, you know, someplace like that, you can go out. You're, they'll let them go out five, six, seven miles. Um, but if they just can't find the comps, then they really have to sharpen their pencil. They really have to go, okay, I've got two good comps, but the third one is not really that good, but I've got to get it on here and then just see what the lender says. If the underwriter's like, okay, we'll sign off on that. The two good ones, it makes sense, then great. But sometimes it'll kill a deal too. It just, you know, there's no control over it. We just don't know what's going to happen. So good question, Mel. Thank you. 
Um, but those low appraisals can be a factor. You know, one of the ways to mitigate the low appraisal is sometimes to take a little bit of money from the uh, down payment. A lot of people are like, hey, I've got 10% down. Well, why not put 8% down and use 2% to give to the seller to make up for the low appraisal or whatever the numbers are going to be. So if you ever run into that situation, let me know because there is a way to do it. And or sometimes people say 20% down, I've got 20% down, that's it, I don't want to pay mortgage insurance. And we go, well, you know, how, how about if you do 15% down and you still don't have to pay mortgage insurance and we'll still give you the same interest rate the Bank of America is giving you. So the lender will pay the mortgage insurance, it usually costs a quarter point to interest rate, but our starting point is usually three eighths of a point better than the big banks here at K-Loans. So there's a way to mitigate that low appraisal, especially if they want to put 20% down and they're petrified about mortgage insurance. There's a way to do it so that all parties benefit. <clears throat> but now one thing to make note of is if it's a low appraisal in with a government loan. So remember this one, a government loan will stay in the CAVERS system, the government appraisal system for up to six months. So if you get a stubborn seller and that stubborn seller says, oh, you know, it's a low appraisal. I'm not going to take the lower price. I'm going to put it back on the market and wait for a cash buyer, which is fine. They don't come along too often or another buyer that's financing. Well, guess what? Two months later, another FHA buyer comes along. That FHA appraisal is going to be in the caver system and they're going to have to use it. doesn't matter who the lender is. It's a government nationwide system. So. If it's, a, if it's a government appraisal, really try to negotiate with them and say, hey, Mr. Seller, you know, if you get another a, a VA buyer, a USDA buyer if it's out in the country, uh, or an FHA buyer, they're going to have to use that same appraisal from two months ago. So why not use the appraisal we have? Let's, let's see if we can get this price accepted and move on. Okay. Da, 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 low appraisals, yeah, they're going to happen. Just call me if you if you run into that situation, and let's see if we can kind of come up with a solution. Um, ba, 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 doing our own valuations. So a lot of times we get, you know, people are people get kind of hung up on CMAs, you know, comparative market analysis. Um, and that's good. A CMA is really important in this industry. It is, is, but there's no right way to do it. Um, sometimes people are like, hey, I want to push the CMA button and do the CMA report, and boom. There's a lot of there's a lot of issues with that. You know, same kind of issues that you know, Zillow has when they value a property. <clears throat> it can be a real problem if you have, uh, you know, if you don't have accurate information or enough information. If you're just kind of going, oh, there's three good comps here, we'll use those. Well. Are they good comps and are there other mitigating factors you should look at? The answer is yes. So when I do a valuation, I don't even bother with CMAs anymore. I kind of make my own CMA. And I start a couple different ways. <clears throat> and you don't have to do it my way. You can go ahead and push the CMA button, put the subject property in there, and then get the comps that, that it spits out. And, and that's fine. Um, we are Ultimately, we are trying to just get into the ballpark to help the seller with a, or the buyer at that point, to help the seller and the buyer with a ballpark price. With the seller, they might say, hey, I want 400, the comp say 380. I say, well, okay, we'll do 400, but just realize that the comps are saying 380. So if we don't get something within a couple weeks, be prepared to lower that price down to the comparables. And usually they say, okay, that's fine. Let's give it a good college try, and then we'll bring the price down. Other people, the smarter ones, are like, let's go in there. The comps say 380, let's do 379. And let's try to get multiple offers and maybe even ratchet that price up to 385. You know, so it can happen different ways. But when I'm doing my valuations, I look at a few things. Number one, I start with, uh, God forbid, Zillow. And the reason I do that is because I want to see what I want to see what the public's looking at. So if you want to list a house at, let's say, $400,000, what is that Zestimate? What are, the, what are the people looking and shopping on Zillow going to think? If they value it at 350 
It's like, oh, okay, we've got a problem here because they're going to come in probably with low offers saying, hey, why should I pay you more when Zillow says this? Now, we all know in the industry, Zillow is not the final word. It might not, not even be the starting word. It is uh, it's kind of a general resource for people to search properties, really, and they make their money off real estate agents paying them fees, um, <clears throat> as well as lenders and, and third parties. But... It, it's a good place to start just because, okay, what's the public going to see? Then after I do that, pretty simple, I'll print that one out, print that property out. Then I'll go to the tax assessor and I'll go, okay, this is assessed at $390,000. We're trying to sell it for 400. That's about right. Cause usually the assessor is a little lower than the actual value. I probably would be lower than that. It'd probably be assessed at 360 and you're selling it at 400. That'd still be reasonable. So, uh, look at the assessor because I also want to get that yearly tax assessment because as I look at comps, I want to see that the tax assessor, who's an appraiser, a licensed appraiser, is seeing the same kind of comps I'm seeing, that those comps are similar in tax assessment. So then once I do that, then I go into the MLS and do what the appraisers are doing. I go out a mile, I go back six months, I look at the same number of bathrooms, I look at the same year range and uh, bedrooms and style and things like that. So if a 1950s rancher, great, I found two other 1950s ranchers that sold four months ago for $400,000. You know, 402, 398, great. We're in the ballpark at 400. Maybe we even push it to 405. But that's that, those are good comps to use. It says the market supported those. Most likely they were financed. Typically, typically you can see those in, in the comps. But if they were financed, there was some appraiser out there saying, hey, yeah, this thing was worth 402. So it's like, all right. If your seller says, well, I want 460, and the comps say 402 and 398, 460 is not going to fly. It's just not going to. And so that's why this information is really important to price it right. But then I usually pull as many comps as I can. And those are sold properties. Going back six months, they're sold. That is really important. Those are the true comps. That is what an appraiser is looking for. I'll also, Mel, to answer your question, they'll they'll look at houses that are on the market or pending and not just sold properties when you're out in rural areas or you have limited comparables. But if you're in the city and you've got good comparables, they want to see that it's sold, not that it's pending or active. So that then I look back at those, do the solds, and then I look at the pendings. And that's, that can tell you a lot. There's a couple of things with pendings and actives. Um, they've got lockboxes on them still, most likely. And so oftentimes I will take my client and go, let's take a look at that. Let's take a look at the competition so we know what shoppers are looking for. So if there's a house down the street that's a good comparable and you walk into it with your client and you're like, wow, these floors are fantastic. All the appliances are new. Looks like the roof was just replaced. This is a really nice house. And they priced it at 385 well your four hundred thousand dollar price point probably is not going to be right because anyone looking at the two houses probably going to take that nicer one at lower price so i mean that's pretty simple math you guys get that but just just if you can go out with your client and look at the competition walk through a couple of those and go okay are we better are we worse and that's where the eye test i tell people you know, valuations, it's a little bit of science and it's a little bit of art. So the science is in the numbers, it's in the, the MLS, it's in going, okay, I found a perfect comp here, here, and here. The art is going into these houses and going, you know, this house is a lot nicer than ours, you know, but it's priced less. We better be careful here. Uh, so, you know, you want to, you just want to use that eye test. You want to just get a feel for it. Again, there's no exact way to do this. But ultimately, it irons out because if you, even if you offer more and they accept more, the appraisal is kind of the governor. It's going gonna, it's gonna to bring that price back down a little bit. So that'll be the governor on a uh, really hot or overheated market. But that's how I do my CMAs. And then I put it in a nice folder in my card, put all that information in there. And then I spread it out on the table and I go, OK, now look at all this information. And they're usually impressed by it. They're like, oh, thank you. You're very thorough. I appreciate that. And then, then we kind of dive into the details. What do you want to list it for? Or you've got all these details. What do you want to make an offer for? So that's where you take that next step. Any questions?
Okay. Then the final point, it's ultimately about the client. Okay. So, you know, really it, it is about the client. Again, a lot of times they'll say, Hey, um, I want to list it for this. I know that it's, it's overpriced, but I want to list it for that. So that's okay. You can do that. And typically there's other agents out there. Those other agents will say, um, yeah, I'll, the house is worth 400. I'll list it for 450. You know, it's like, whoa. And most savvy sellers understand that they're just throwing a number out there to get the business. And then ultimately they'll beat them down and they'll sell for 400 if they even keep them on. So I try to be honest with them and say, this is where I think it should be. But if you want to go a little bit higher, that's fine. But let's have reasonable expectations of when we're going to ratchet down the price to where I think it should be. And if they say no, they're like, okay, you think it should be 400 and I want to sell it for 500 and you know, screw you. I usually walk away. That's when I say, you know what? There's other agents out there that will list it for 500. You'll get it on the MLS. You'll go through six months of pain and ultimately you'll probably fire them and get beaten down to the price where it needs to be. So, um, but if they're in the ballpark, if it's worth 400 and they want to list for 410, I'm like, okay, I'll do that as long as the expectations are reasonable. So that's really important right there. Uh, but it's about the client. You know, what are their goals? What are their expectations? What's their time frame? I have a client right now here in this area. They've got a house being built. It's already framed, yet they're high on the house that they're selling. And I've told them, you know, you're not going to get this price. So you want to come down a little bit. So she's being a little bit stubborn, but we're going to have that conversation here in about a week or two. Uh, that's going to be a little bit more painful for her. But that's the reality of the market. It's just she has the nicest house in the neighborhood, and it's hard to sell that nicest house when she's done things like put $200,000 in landscaping. Well, that doesn't add value. It does and it doesn't. I mean, that adds value because someone likes it, but it's, uh, an appraiser is not going to see the value. They don't care whether that tree costs $1,000 and you got 20 of them. Um, they just see that the house is X amount of square feet and it's X price and they're going to pull their comps and they're going to go on and do their thing. So it can be, there's a lot of art and science in this process, but um, it's up to you to really listen to your client and figure out what their goals are and see how reasonable they are and kind of feel them out a little bit and then move from there because ultimately they dictate what we do. Okay, I'm finished. Any questions? Dun, dun, dun. I don't see any more questions. Okay. So you guys, um, that's it on appraisals, inspections, valuations. I know I covered the basics here. There's more to it than that, but feel free to contact me if you do have a question or something comes up, low appraisal, um, a bad appraiser, a bad inspector, things like that. Just that's what I'm here for. So I appreciate your time. Have a very good July 11th and uh, let's go out there and keep selling. All right, signing off. See you, everyone.